Okay, last class session was about, you know, whether or not nonprofits should be competing for donor dollars. Uh, today's discussion is about how to compete. Um, it's a much more tool-based discussion. Remember, these tools, like any tool, can be used for good or evil. And I hope you guys decide to use them for good. Let's dig in. Um, the goals for today's class session, I want you to be able to give two fundraising examples from any of the following things. Source variables, message variables, and request variables. And then I want you to give a fundraising example of any of the following. The availability heuristic, the representativeness heuristic, framing and anchoring, overconfidence, endowment effect, and loss aversion, or fairness. And we'll dig into each of those. Um, there's a great article as part of the reading about enhancing helping behavior. Um, it lays out a framework by which we can understand donor appeals. The idea is that as a nonprofit, you craft the antecedents, and these come in the form of source variables, message variables, and request variables. Essentially, this is the donor appeal that's sent out into the world. And we're going to talk about each of these elements. Well, ideally, you send your message, you send your appeal out into the world, and it produces helping behavior. You get people who want to help you in what you do. But, as is always the case, when you send out a message into the world, um, it's not always interpreted the way you intended. I think all of us have had that experience where you say something and it didn't come out right or is misunderstood. Um, in the case of donors, it happens in two ways. Um, two things moderate the message. One is donor variables. So these are variables unique to the donor. So the donor is, for example, um, uh, the donor is maybe um, rich, poor, um, the donor comes from a certain ethnic background, the donor is highly educated, poorly educated, the donor is in a good mood that day or in a bad mood that day. Do you see there are a lot of different variables that can change the way an appeal is, is seen or received by the donor. Um, Non-donor variables have to do more with environment, like maybe there's a scandal in the news recently about nonprofits, maybe there are economic troubles being predicted or, or forecast. Um, bad weather that day, so, um, you know, uh, I don't know, there are all kinds of things. Um, something in the news that's distracting them from what you want to talk about, right? Those are non-donor variables. Well, the, the idea is this model sort of describes the way you need to think about a fundraising appeal. Anytime you send a message out into the world, right, it says certain things, but it has to be, but it's always moderated by things outside of your control. So it's sort of like, you know, um, is, is, it's sort of like um, uh, hitting a golf shot into the wind, right? You have to adapt for the way the wind is going to shift your message. Um, and you hope, obviously, to finally get it to land where it's supposed to, which is people helping you out. Um, the, the way the reading describes source variables, there are three I want to emphasize. Um, image familiarity is one of those variables. This is where um, there's general awareness of your charity, good or bad. Um, We'll talk about examples of image familiarity in class. Um, another source variable is image efficiency. This is the perceived level of donations going to program expenses. This is sort of like how much of my dollar actually goes to the charitable program. That's an efficiency message of image. And it has to do with who you are as a source um, of this message. And then there's image effectiveness, which is the perceived level success in meeting objectives. So this isn't so much about efficiency of dollars spent, more about impact of dollars spent, like what difference is being made in the world. Uh, we're going to talk about these attributes. Um, some of them are easier to control than others, um, but uh, they're all part of who you are when you're asking other people for money. We're going to lump together message variables and request variables at the same time because they tend to overlap a lot. Um, one of those variables is, is uh, about messages cause of need why do you need their help why do the people you're helping need help why is your cause worthwhile another one is justice um, meaning that you're conveying to people that the cause of need here is the result of injustice justice is, a, is an interesting one it makes certain fundraising campaigns difficult it's hard to raise money for drug rehabilitation for example because most people feel like what what drug addicts suffer from is a just outcome. They, they brought it upon themselves, right? But um, a really easy and popular um, cause to raise money for relates to children because children very rarely have put themselves by choice into their circumstance. Um, and so you can portray what happens to kids more easily as being unjust. And if you can, then you're more likely to get money. 
Um, another one is similarity. There's this idea that people are like us. Um, when BYU uh, calls you on the phone after you graduate because they want you to donate money, um, they're going to use students to do it. And part of the reason they use students is because it will help you remember what it was like when you were a student. Right? There's a similarity of connection there, and that helps you to feel maybe a stronger desire to give. Um, beneficiary portrayal is really important. The way you portray the people who are benefiting from uh, from what uh, you're doing. Um, for example, you could show pictures of starving kids or pictures of well-fed kids who were formerly starving, um, and whether or not the kids are being helped or whether or not they're um, uh, you know looking sad or happy. That can actually influence quite a bit the way a donor receives your message. I also want to point out that on this there is an ethical concern. Um, I think a lot of people use pictures of um, especially developing world people. So you take you go on a trip internationally, you take a bunch of pictures, and then you say, hey, I'm going to use this smiling face of this little kid in our new ad campaign. Um, you, you shouldn't do that without their permission. Um, in the United States, you have to get permission, and we should treat them with the same level of respect we treat you know, people in the United States. I think too often we think it's for a good cause, and so we assume this person's identity as being part of our, our message even though that person may not have granted permission for you to do that. Um, gift comparisons are a popular request variable. Um, you help people understand how much they should give by knowing where they fit relative to others. And so you might say, for example, well, people in your neighborhood have made an average donation of $20. That sort of benchmarks me to know where I had to give. Um, related to that uh, is the idea of donor labeling. Um, this is where you compare the gifts that they've already given and label them in a certain way. So, for example, you've got silver level level donors who give five thousand, and, and gold level donors who give ten, and platinum who give twenty, and so on. The idea is you sort of give them special labels as it relates to their level of giving. You give them these labels that relate to their level of giving, and and the idea is to incentivize the non-platinum donors to pony up more so they can be called a platinum donor. Um, empathy versus sympathy is an imp interesting problem. Um, one is the idea try, when you ask somebody to imagine what it would be like if such and such thing happened in your life. Um, the other is to ask them to remember what it was like when that happened in their life. There's a difference between the two. One requires us to project, one requires us to remember. And you can actually get different reactions from people depending on which one you invoke. So empathy obviously comes harder to people than sympathy. It's easier for us to remember moments of our lives rather than to imagine or project what a moment of our life might be like. Um, there's a difference between those two and you can get different responses depending on how you craft your message. Um, perceived choice is critically important when it comes to um, donations. If, if all of you have had the experience or felt coerced or compelled to make a donation even though you didn't like it, um, you will you may have made a donation that day, but you probably make it, never make another one again to that nonprofit. It's really important that donors feel a sense of decision-making power when you ask them to give or not. And then finally, um, self-efficacy is really important. Donors like to feel like their dollars are actually making a difference. And there are ways you can craft your message so that they sense that. So they sort of feel like, yes, if I make this donation, I will... Um, uh, make a difference in the world. Uh, there are challenges to using all these messages. Obviously, non-donor variables can hamper effectiveness of your message. Um, for example, competing charities with better images will probably prevail. You know, if you are in the business of disaster relief and you're not the Red Cross, well, then you're competing against the Red Cross and they have a huge amount of image familiarity and you're, they're going to be way ahead of you and that's outside of your control. One of the challenges is that when you have a chance to make a fundraising appeal and ask for money, uh, that opportunity is usually brief and once in a lifetime, meaning you get one shot at a donor and the shot you have is very short. And so it's not like you have time to sort of get a sense of the lay of the land before you can decide how to craft a message. And so nonprofits are probably crafting inefficient messages all the time, simply because they don't know the donors well enough. But 
You may not have the chance to get to the, know the donor well enough before you ask for money. Um, most nonprofit marketing also requires an understanding of persistent and transient donor characteristics. Persistent characteristic would be uh, income level, for example. Uh, a transient one would be something like their mood that day. Um, you have to understand and know how to manage those, both of those things when you ask people for money. Okay. Now, this next unit relates to behavioral economics and fundraising. Um, those of you who are in the day class, most of you got this material from me during the communications class last semester. Those executive students in second years that are taking my class right now, um, you haven't gotten this yet, and I don't want to go into too much detail because I'm going to do a survey that will be helpful um, in illustrating the concept. So we're going to wait for that. Um, I do want to just make sure that this idea is clear. Usually when people make choices, uh, an economist assumes that their choice is all three of these, it reflects all three of these attributes, specifically that your, your choices are reflexive, meaning all A's are equally valuable to you. So when you go to the store and there are a dozen boxes of cereal on the shelf, you're indifferent between all three of them as long as the boxes of cereal are the same, or you're indifferent between all the boxes as long as they're all the same. So that's a reflexive preference. Transitive preferences means that, that you can order your preferences uh, and that the order is consistent. And so this would be, for example, you like apples better than bananas and bananas better than cherries. And so we've laid out an order of your preferences. Well, if you like apples better than bananas and bananas better than cherries, well, it also means you like apples better than cherries is the idea. Um, finally, a rational person's preferences are complete, meaning you can take all the things in the world you'd ever want and you can put them in order. Um, so with that, those assumptions, it turns out, are flawed. Um, people don't actually make choices this way. Um, usually, transitivity is violated, reflexivity is often violated, and completeness never really even exists because we don't sit down and contemplate all of the possible sets of preferences we may have. It's just too big and complex. And so economists are starting psychological research into something called behavioral economics. And I'm not going to dive into these right now because we're going to discuss them. But basically, we're going to talk about six fundamental attributes of the irrational ways that people make decisions. And these irrational decisions that people make are important for us in a fundraising context because we're going to talk about the way they can influence whether or not a donor chooses to give. Generally, we divide these into how we view the world and how we view ourselves. But again, the general concept here is that people's preferences are not rational, and it's important to understand the ways that they're not. Because if you can appreciate the patterns of irrational behavior, you can help them make better choices. So that's it. I look forward to seeing you all in class.